Thanks for having me here this morning. Um, I assume you can all do math, so that means I've been at Sequoia for 17 years. And uh, in the 17 years, I've had a really close up view in terms of direct interaction uh, with, I counted the other day, over 65 companies where I met the entrepreneurs, got on their board, and took them, hopefully in the better cases, to glorious uh, public market high valuation outcomes, maybe acquisitions, and then in the cases uh, that weren't so great, those are probably the ones where I learned the most. But in addition to that, just being at Sequoia, if you add up all the companies that I've been close to with my partners, it's hundreds and hundreds over the, that period of time. And one of the keys about venture capital is it, it's a bit of a, a pattern matching business. So you do tend to see a lot of patterns over those years of what works in startups and what doesn't. You also tend to see a lot of technology changes and what that means for the startup. So what I want to focus on today and talk about a little bit is some of the technology changes, but rather than this being the normal technology trend talk, I want to highlight for you the, the dramatic nature of some of the changes and just how almost uh, scary some of the impact could be in terms of where we are on, on, on the curves. And then what I also want to talk about afterwards is what that implies in terms of the change or maybe no change to the formula for building a great company or, or picking a great company as a venture capitalist. So let's start with talking about what's new or, or what's changing. One way to look at it uh, is everything and nothing. What I mean by that is on the technology side, which I'll get into, the changes are so dramatic at this point in time. We've never seen an acceleration of some of the trends as we're seeing now. We're at a really interesting point. And for those of you who remember your math and, and understand exponential curves, you'll, you'll remember that the curves only really get interesting when it goes almost straight up. And that's where we are with some really key trends. Now, the nothing that's changed is the sort of Newtonian laws of starting a great company in terms of what you have to keep in mind and investing. And, and really, we don't think those have changed. Despite anything you might have read about the dramatic change in the way to do venture capital or the way to start a company, I'll, I'll elaborate on those points. But starting with some of the key things that have changed in a very dramatic fashion, you're all familiar with Moore's Law which is, uh, by definition, an exponential law. It says that compute power should double roughly every 18 months. And one thing about exponential curves you should think about is, in the early days, they're not that interesting because the numbers are small. So you don't notice the change that much when you go from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16. That's not that big of a deal. When all of a sudden you go from 2 billion, 4 billion, 8 billion, 16 billion, and whatever metric you're measuring, that's when it starts to get really interesting. And with compute, we are at a really interesting point in time. So this past year, a single computer could equate to the power of the, of the brain of a, of a mouse. It's estimated by 2020, a single computer, a single compute element can be the equivalent of the power of the human brain. And by 2040, 2045, Kurzweil uh, talks about singularity, if you've ever read him. And that is when the power of a single computer can surpass the collective intelligence of the human race, the collective brain power of the human race. And if you did read Kurzweil, you'll know that after singularity, really crazy things could happen. So all of this is causing this massive acceleration. One could argue, by the way, that almost all of the technology trends that I'll mention or that you're all familiar with, things like virtualization and, and uh, uh, a lot of the networking technologies are also a function of this curve, as compute has just hit these really interesting points on the almost straight up curve. That's when this really dramatic changes. Second, in terms of growth, we're seeing a dramatic uh, decrease in the amount of time technologies take to proliferate. So if you think about the PC, it took about seven years to hit 100 million users. The internet took about five years. The mobile phone took about three years. If you think about a company like Facebook, uh, I don't know if I have my numbers exactly right, but it was about four years, I think, before they hit 100 million users. Instagram, which we funded a year or so ago, took two years to hit 100 million users. So the time is compressing, and the graphs are getting super You've probably heard or you recognize yourself. We're in a post-PC era, meaning rapid move to mobile phones. Uh, this year, there'll be 3 billion mobile phones out there. And it's estimated by 20, uh, 2020 to be 10 billion. And what this has, besides just the obvious uh, implications of all that technology getting into 
uh, so many more hands, this has dramatic implications for companies, for startups. So take some of the obvious examples like a, a mobile app. If you were starting a mobile application company and it was good enough, and you were in 2010 or 20, uh, and you had 10 billion devices with the distribution capabilities that are out there today, it wouldn't be inconceivable that you could be on billions of platforms in an extremely sh short period of time, I mean virtually overnight. And that's, that's unprecedented in the history of technology. So that obviously has dramatic impact on companies, how rapidly the ecosystem can change, how rapidly leaders can change, um, and I'll talk about some of the other implications. SaaS, you're all familiar with uh, software as a service, and the way I think about SaaS when I describe these exponential curves is SaaS historically has been on sort of the, the flatter part of the exponential curve. It's been maturing, and this is evidence right here. 1.2 trillion in market cap for software companies, and this says 56 billion in market cap for companies. We just had public, so that number is probably about 65 billion. Uh, but the point is, it has a long way to go, but we're at this really interesting tipping point. I would argue we're at that inflection point in the exponential curve for SaaS, because talk to any enterprise or any IT uh, buyer, and all they want is software as a service, Yet we're at that point in the market share, the penetration. So, you know, one would expect that SaaS is right hitting that knee of, a, of an exponential curve. That'll cause dramatic changes in the ecosystem and, uh, of the players and so on, leaders. Cloud. Now, what's interesting is the underlying technology that enabled what we call cloud these days actually was virtualization. I was just chatting with someone from VMware here. And uh, myself and a partner were, were probably two of the first to go talk to Diane Green over at Stanford when she was starting VMware. Um, and the point is that was in, I think, 98 or so. VMware and virtualization took a long time to mature. They were essentially in that sort of flatter part of the exponential curve. But now look, and we're at a point where 80% or 75% of application workloads in an enterprise are now running on virtualized instances. So that technology has now sort of gone in the straight up phase. It has enabled what they call cloud, which is things like Amazon Web Services and, and other things out in the internet. And the macro growth, I mean the, the market size growth of cloud is just stunning. We're going from a $30 billion a year market to a over $50 billion a year market in two years. That's a lot of growth in, in, with pretty big numbers. And what that also means is all the startup companies that are supporting and benefiting from that radical shift to cloud, because it is pretty dramatic, in terms of an IT infrastructure, uh, they can benefit if they hit it right from that same trauma in, in the other. Bioinformatics. You know, a, a firm like Sequoia, historically, at least in the last almost 20 years that I've been there, uh, haven't done a whole lot in healthcare and, and medical uh, field, primarily because of the FDA and the long cycles, it just didn't fit well with the venture model to have to go through a 10 year very expensive FDA cycle. However, there's an area, aspect of healthcare and medical related technologies that's gotten very interesting, and that's bioinformatics, led primarily by the cost of sequencing uh, a genome. It wasn't too long ago when they started the genome product that, uh, project that it was over a billion dollars to sequence a genome. Then it was 100 million, today it's less than $1,000. So a billion to 1,000 in a very short period of time, and it's expected to be under $100. If you think about what that could potentially enable, I can tell you right now, and entrepreneurs are thinking about what it can enable because there's a huge flood of really interesting startups that are exploiting that incredibly disruptive, dramatic shift. Um, and I think you'll see dramatic breakthroughs in, in medical-related uh, products and technologies. And finally, startups, the cost to get a startup off the ground. Now, granted, this really applies most particularly to, to a few categories, things what I call above the infrastructure, so applications, be it a web application or a mobile application. Uh, just 10 or, or 15 years ago, um, it was much more expensive to get one of those companies off the ground. If you remember the late 90s, that's probably what sunk a lot of the first wave of internet companies, is it was really expensive. They had to build so much of their own technology to just get their app up. Today, it's very inexpensive, depending on uh, what you're doing, but with open source software, cloud services you can use, Amazon, $500 PCs, and so on, it could be very inexpensive to get a startup off the ground. And by the way, this trend alone is, is probably 
the dominant force behind this rise of this discussion about angels and angels displacing VCs and all that, it really had to do with the fact that there was a good sized category of companies that could at least get the first product on very little money. I mean, smart entrepreneurs these days, uh, I'll exaggerate slightly, over a weekend, you know, on 20K or whatever, can, can get an app up and running and, and try it. And that wasn't the case before. However, there's a subtlety to what it takes to go from having that first product actually growing a company that I'll address later, where it's not quite so easy as the 20K or 100K investment. So what has all this resulted in? What it's resulted in is, in my opinion, our opinion, in the best uh, time in venture capital, the most exciting time in venture capital, perhaps in the history of venture capital, because across so many different segments, there's so much massive disruption caused by all those curves hitting the exponential straight up point uh, that we're seeing really exciting startups and entrepreneurs coming to us in a wider variety of categories than we've ever seen. It's not like it was yesteryear where there'd be a sort of hot category of the day and everything else was boring and then you know, you'd move on and five years later there'd be another hot category. It's across a lot of different segments. I mentioned bioinformatics, healthcare, energy, IT, everything. So today's a great time actually to uh, start a company if you are on to those trends and accurately understand them enough. There's a lot of interest in venture capital and we're probably busy, we are busier than we've ever been and uh, Sequoia is 40 years old. So in our 40 year history, we're busier than we've ever been. So that's all what changed, what has changed really dramatically, I think in the last 18 months, 24 months. I'm gonna now shift and talk about things that really haven't changed. And this will sound a little strange, but um, one thing that hasn't changed is that there is change, meaning change is a constant. The only con the, there's an expression that says, the only constant in our business is change. So certain things are cyclic or somewhat predictable, and certainly the waves of the economy in times when, that are good and times that are bad, it is a cyclic process. So going way back, Sequoia started in 1972, so we had downturn in the 70s, we had the 1987 crash, we had a uh, slow period in the 90s, then we had, the, of course, um, the bubble, and the bubble crash, and then in the 2000, 2008 crash. Now, the interesting point about this, and it's somewhat counterintuitive, is that for us anyway, in, and for some of the other top venture capitalists, there's this interesting correlation where the worst times tended to actually create some of the best companies. And when you think about that, uh, it's, somewhat, it's somewhat logical if, if you think it through. First of all, there's a bit of a Darwinian aspect to it. So when you're in rough times, bleak market, no one's spending money on anything, first of all, it filters the entrepreneurs pretty well. I mean, you really only have the entrepreneurs with the real fortitude and the, and the guts and the smarts to almost dare to start a company, number one. Number two, if they show any signs of life, if their idea shows any signs of life, it must be a really good idea, right? So there's another filtering aspect to it. And then finally, well, from the VC side, we love it. We love those times because there's no competition. Everybody seems to go hide under a rock. So there's you know, less uh, um, unnatural valuation pressure and that sort of thing. And then for the startup, there's somewhat less competition. There's fewer companies and, and recruiting, if they have a great company, they stand out a lot more. So they recruit better. So in a very strange way, some of those worst times of those cycles uh, are the best times to start companies. And that really hasn't changed. Now I talked about the, the exponential aspect of uh, compute power, for example, and characterized that as a change. And I think the reason that is something that really has changed is we are at that dramatic uptick point. But if you think about the trend and the fact that it has been exponential, this, this graph actually goes back 110 years and makes sort of an abstract claim that the notion of, a, of, a, of compute power uh, since the beginning of anything that would be equated to computing has been doubling roughly every 18 months, is, is it on a logarithmic scale, kind of a, a linear, somewhat predictable function. So the fact that compute power has been increasing that much hasn't really changed from a graphical point of view. As I said, just the impact has gotten so much more dramatic and startling now that we're at the interest point in the graph. Similarly, storage, this is the cost, uh, yeah, bits per dollar and constant $2,000. And again, logarithmically plotted, that's somewhat linear. Now, the best entrepreneurs get all this, and the ones who walk in the doors who, ten, door who tend to you know, shoot a little bit ahead of the curve or extrapolate from these graphs and understand how dramatic things will be different two or three years from now when they're at stride, those are the ones we really like to back.
So there's a subtlety here, and it goes back to this point about the rise of angels and this notion in some of the popular press that today you can start a company and be very successful, and you know who needs big dollars from venture capitalists? You can just get away with 200K from the dentist down the street. Uh, there's a subtle difference, and an important difference between the cost to start one of these companies, i.e. get a little product into the market or get it off the ground, and to actually build a company. And it relates to some of those trends I talked about, because the idea now that successful companies can proliferate so quickly. Remember those graphs, I, uh, the stats I gave you about how quickly some of those companies went to 100 million users? What that says is it's become a bit of a winner-take-all game. So if you expect to lead a category, you have to really lead the category. In markets where you don't have that distribution power and there's isolated little islands, you can have sort of multiple companies in a fragmented market that can sort of survive and do kind of okay. And they don't perhaps have to run that hard. But in this world, if you have something and you want to be the market leader, you have to run extremely fast. So what that translates to for companies, some of the companies on our portfolio, like Dropbox or Airbnb, you might have noticed have raised really big financing rounds, hundreds of millions of dollars recently. And it's for that very reason that they got off the ground with very little capital and they started to really establish their rapid growth. But then they recognized quickly that if they wanted to dominate globally and be that market leader, they had to run very, very fast. So it, it's a bit of an unpleasant surprise sometimes to these startups that think that they can get away with just the few hundred K and they're, they're golden. If they really want to lead, they have to, they have to uh, step into a different lead. So here's one of the key things that really hasn't changed at all in our opinion. For 40 years, we've used this formula to pick the startups that have the shot at being what we call the posters, the enduring companies that are going to be around you know, 20, 30, 40 years. So let me run through them really quickly, just to give you a simple example. So clarity of purpose. Don Valentine, the founder of Cisco, uh, Sequoia, used to say that if you walked in the door and you couldn't describe your business in a single declarative sentence, then you probably had a bad idea. So Cisco was always touted as a good example, which they walked in the door and they say, uh, we connect networks. That's it. Uh, it. Very clear exactly what they did. Everyone understood what networks were. They needed to be connected because they were very heterogeneous at the time. That's what they did. That's what they essentially continue to do to this day. Market, Sequoia, uh, in, characterized by Don in the very early days, was always uh, slightly differentiated from its competitors in, in in that Don had a hyper focus on market, maybe more so than any other characteristic he was looking for in, in startups. Because one way to think about it is the market is one thing you have very hard time as a startup changing. You know, you're a little tiny company, you maybe when you hit scale, if you really have something innovative and new, you can help create a new market, that's great. But in terms of convincing the world to do something they don't already recognize they need to do or have a, have a pain they don't already know they have, that's a little hard. So you're going to have the best product, best team, and if you pick a lousy market, it's going to be rough going. So picking the right market is extremely important, probably one of the most dominant uh, criteria we look for. Alleviate customer pain. One thing we've noticed is our best companies, most famous companies, all the way back to, to Cisco, Yahoo, Google, et cetera, Dropbox more recently, it's a case where the entrepreneur is solving a problem they have themselves. And it just so happens millions of other people have that same problem. So Cisco, the, there was the husband and wife team at Stanford uh, who were running the networks or running the IT infrastructure, and they couldn't get computers to talk to each other because it was DeckNet and Apple Talk and all these other things, and they had to build a box to connect it to, hence you know, the first Cisco router. Um, similarly, the, the Yahoo founders couldn't find what they wanted on the, in the early internet, so they created the sort of essentially the yellow pages of the internet. And then Drew with Dropbox, he hated mailing files to himself uh, when he went home, you know, so he went and created Dropbox. So that's usually a really good sign. It's, it's also the case that if you aren't addressing an intense enough pain, you're going to end up in a difficult spot where you're pushing instead of getting pulled. And that's not where you want to be with a startup. There's plenty of them out there. They tend to be the ones you see raising lots of money and spending lots of money. And it's oftentimes a little symptom that they're pushing. You don't want to be there. You want to be in the ones that take little money and really get pulled. Team DNA, we've recognized in, in our sort of pattern matching over 40 years that the DNA of a startup gets set in those first 90 days. And once set, it's really hard to change. So basically, if you screw it up in the first 90 days, it's really hard to fix it. So in terms of practice inside of Sequoia, just as kind of a unique little uh, thing we do, we have an intense focus, uh, call it a 90-day plan 
from the instant we write that first check, it's kind of an all hands on that startup to figure out who do we need to hire, who's that, those first team members, what do we have to do to make it so that their DNA is set in the way that you know, we've, we've seen works really well and help the founders do that. Um, and that has wonderful rewards down the road. Product focus, this is related to, uh, and I was on board of, of this company, NetScreen, that, that, uh, that did very well. Uh, this is related to another characteristic we have, which is we don't like to overfund companies. In fact, one could argue we like to sort of keep them very, very lean. And, and that only works for a certain set of founders. Some founders are absolutely enamored with the idea of I'm gonna go raise as much money as I possibly can. You know, if I can get it, I'm gonna get it. This, I guess, some argument to be made there. Our issue is, and our conclusion is, that when there's scarcity, like capital in your bank account, it's a wonderfully focused uh, mechanism. So if you had 10 million, for example, in that startup, you might be tempted to try two or three different product lines kind of all at once or two different, three different markets because you're not sure. So you try them all. Well, you're gonna waste a lot of money and probably not be successful. You have two million in your bank account and you can only do one, it's gonna sharpen the thinking. So focus in product, focus in thinking, frugality, uh, real operating margins. Uh, I'll address this a little bit later in terms of, uh, you know, when I started, I had a very engineering and technical background, didn't know a lot about the financials and uh, partners at Sequoia when I was interviewing just said, okay, do you know what a gross margin is? I said, yeah, describe that. And they said, good, you're good. That's all you need to know, really. And I'll talk about that because it translates to operating margins. If you don't have, if you can have the most wonderful business in terms of billions and billions of revenue on the top line, but if the nature of the business you're in is such that you can't generate profit at the bottom line, you don't have a sustainable company. You're eventually going to hit a wall. Frugality, I mentioned that a little bit. Um, we tend to back companies, and we actually have an internal culture at Sequoia uh, that is just extremely frugal. From the founding of Sequoia, from the founding of our best companies, and even though they grow up and they get very large like a Google, you know, sometimes you can see remnants of that culture, hopefully, last a long time inside. And finally, Inferno with a single match. It relates to that comment I, I mentioned before about hitting a real pain point. Um, but it also encompasses something else, which is the smartest founders, and they tend to be the ones that are most successful for us, don't want to raise a lot of money because they're incredibly dilution sensitive. They want to hit, they want to start a company that takes little money to start, so they give away very little of the company, and they want to hit all those other attributes correctly so the thing really starts to take off um, you know, without having to raise more and more money, depend on what I call the kindness of strangers, which is VCs or whoever, they're expected to give them money, they're, they're self-sufficient, very early on. There was a Stanford study done uh, by Mark Leslie, the, the founder of Veritas, I think he uh, teaches at Stanford, and I read this paper he wrote a while back that tried to correlate the amount of money startups raised and spent before they turned profitable with the ultimate success of those companies, the ultimate size. And it was really interesting, but to us, I guess, not surprising. There was an inverse correlation. The Oracles, Cisco's, Yahoo's, et cetera, they spent very little money before they turned profitable. In fact, Cisco, we invested way before my time, but we invested, I think, $2 million. And John Morgridge said, okay, I promise I'm not ever gonna have to use this, and he never did. We already turned profitable before he had to tip into our $2 million. Uh, Oracle, the story is it was about $7 million and so on. So sub $10 million for these giant companies. So that tells you something. It tells you they hit all these other metrics. So I spent a lot of time on that. The other thing that hasn't changed, I won't go into detail here, but in terms of what we look for when a company walks in the door, so what we look for in a business plan, that really hasn't changed. So I described all these dramatic technology shifts, exponential curves going straight up and so on, which to us means massive disruption, wonderful opportunities. But when that new set of founders walks in the door, we find a new set of founders, we're thinking about these same things we thought about probably 40 years ago because we think they're still true. So I went through many of them, but you know, to, to dig into a few, it's when we look at the market, it's not only how big it is, but what are the characteristics of the market? Can you create a company that's really big in that market? Sometimes you can't. Uh, we were in a storage company, I remember, uh, years ago, I think it was called Rhapsody, where the company was doing really well, um, but it became clear as we grew the company that in, at that time in the storage industry, it was ruled by four or five big giant OEMs, and there was sort of no crack of light to get between them to grow much bigger, so we ultimately uh, took an acquisition by that company. But Understanding that kind of market characteristic early is really important so you can know when you're making that first investment or the founders are about to commit years and years of their lives, you know, what the possible outcomes are. And there's many more details. 
I mentioned gross margin, and sorry to be sort of overly simplistic to you uh, uh, MBA grads here, but uh, gross margin, if you think about it, is just one really interesting telling me metric because it, it captures so much when you look at the gross margin of a company. Really, when you analyze a company and you want to be efficient, one of the first questions you can ask is, what's the gross margin? Because think about it. If a company has a high gross margin, by definition, it must be addressing a real customer pain, right? Because otherwise, you know, why would they pay the company so much more than whatever the service costs or the product costs? They must really be differentiated, because if they weren't, they'd be 15 me twos, drive the price down, commoditize, low gross margin, right? It translates to lower cash requirements if you build a company, right? Because you have all that to start with, you know, after revenue, cost, goods, bang, you have all this money to deal with then. So if you run your company lean enough, you can be a very profitable company. Um, higher growth potential for that very reason, because you can actually consciously choose with all that extra cash to step on the gas, to actually start accelerating sales, marketing, and so on, and grow, and then higher profitability potential. So there's one component of what could be a sustainable company. I'd zoom in on gross margin, and that hasn't changed. Founder attributes, it's said that we, uh, we and, and a lot of our peers at the, at the VCs who have uh, the long track records and tend to do pretty well, um, we don't look for the founders that some of the textbooks say we look for. We don't look for the founders actually with the wonderful resumes and the pedigree and so on. Oftentimes it's founders that are a little off. In fact, our best founders have uh, some characteristics that would be considered a little odd. Sometimes they're incredibly difficult to deal with, very often actually, sometimes huge egos. They're obsessive, they're inquisitive, they never sleep, they never, they, you know, they, they're strange dudes and, or, or women. And, uh, but the point is, they'll do anything. They'll go through brick walls to make their idea succeed. Sometimes they're the only ones that believe in their idea. Even folks like us may be skeptical at first, but their obsession and drive is typically what makes them ultimately success, successful. So founders are everything in our business, and finding the folks with those right key attributes, that will forgive so many sins, because those founders also iterate. We have some of our most successful companies. There was a company, Meraki, which we, uh, uh, had acquired for over a billion dollars last year, and, and uh, that company probably changed its business plan four times in its evolution, you know, before it got it right, but it had wonderful founders, and they kept iterating and kept being aggressive. And that's true, if you look under the covers of some of our best companies, they didn't do, by the end, what they set out to do, but they had great founders who kept iterating and changing. So if you think about it, uh, people always wonder what startups have that give them the edge, and you know, the truth is they really don't typically have, you know, smart, necessarily smarter people than big companies, GEs and IBMs. They have wonderfully smart people in their labs. And maybe they have an innovative product, but they don't necessarily have a product that a big company couldn't replicate, perhaps. What they do have, though, if they do it right, is they have stealth, they have speed, and they have focus. So when you're looking at a startup or in a company, you have an idea, anything, the red flag should go up. Anytime there's anything to do with that company that starts to negatively impact any one of those characteristics. Because then you're just giving away your really only advantage in, in the first sort of fragile years. So we're hyper-focused on that. In fact, by the way, almost every comment I'm making about these attributes of startups that hasn't changed despite these wonderful market changes, those same comments are actually true about being successful in the venture business in terms of running a firm and growing a firm. So in Sequoia, almost I could have had a similar um, voiceover about Sequoia for almost every one of these slides in that to be a successful venture firm, an enduring venture firm, you have to think just like a startup company, to constantly be changing, think about stealth, speed, agility, and so on. And again, be sensitive to anything that starts to impact that. Distractions, for example, in VC land are, are rife in terms of where you want to open offices and what would be great and cool and trendy. You have to think about these things as to whether or not you want to stay on, on the top. So, sorry for the crude slide. I think I made this one, and our marketing folks made the other slide, as you can tell. But I was trying to prove a point, because this one's really a, a little subtle, but I've thought about it a lot in all the companies that I've been involved in. There's this way of thinking that I think is very useful for a startup, uh, or for example, for a venture firm, but for a startup, what you want to do is make sure that you have perfect alignment. If these were, remember, transparencies? Any of you old enough to remember transparencies? Uh, if you had transparencies, and I drew on transparencies, First, sort of, okay, what market pain is this company going to address? And I drew it as a blob, and then there's the red heat spot, right? Then I layered on, you know, 
where will this company have the most differentiation? So what, for whatever product or service they have, where is that differentiation? Well, guess what? When I layer that transparency on, it better line up with that point of where I defined as the most market paint. And similarly, where am I going to hire the best people? Where am I going to go a little overboard in terms of paying the best people or whatever? It better line up. And finally, where am I going to take the most risk? This sounds pretty simple. Probably in your business school cases back when you're in business school, a lot of failures. It's because you can identify a misalignment in one of these. And I've seen it on the board of startups. You know, I'll be on the board of a startup and it's going to do some super cool networking product or whatever that's different than anybody else, different than Cisco, anything because it has some core differentiation. And then all of a sudden you hear about the schedule being delayed by a month or several months because we're late with this piece of technology over here that has nothing to do with what makes this thing different. It's something we should have just bought off the shelf. Why do we have people over there doing this crazy thing you know, that really has nothing to do with the core focus? So this is actually critical and this hasn't changed. This way of thinking, I think, hasn't changed no matter what drama is happening. In gears a little bit, talking about at least perceived change in venture capital. Um, this is the kind of thing you've probably read a lot about over the last bunch of years. It relates a little bit to the comments I made earlier about how because there are categories of startups that you can get off the ground cheaper. There's been the rise of the angels, so a lot of articles about how VCs are irrelevant, et cetera. And uh, I guess one way my partner put it is, is we didn't get the memo. Uh, uh, Sequoia, for example, just in last year, we had more than 15 exits. You know, several billion dollars in, in returns just last year alone and uh, the forward-looking projection just of the activity level and the companies that are growing faster than several of those companies I quoted to continue the exponential uh, drive in growth rate of some of these companies. We're seeing plenty of them. We're involved in plenty of them. I'm sure our, our top-tier competitors are also involved in plenty of them. So I, I think, uh, I think you know, the, the, the death of VC was um, great, greatly exaggerated. And one of the key points is that I said the only constant is change. That has to be true within a venture capital firm as well. So Sequoia, while I think a lot of the core values inside Sequoia, the core tenets of what we look for in startups, as I described, probably haven't changed. In terms of tactics, just like any great startup, just like Google has to do to stay on top, we have to constantly be changing our business. One, one of my partners, the way he put it, is you ha constantly have to be taking risks that could put yourself out of business just like a great company would in the technology landscape, just like an Apple would to stay on top. And folks like Sequoia and I'm sure our peers do that all the time. So finally, switching to one other thing that hasn't changed, it's true for Sequoia in terms of our humble start and what we ended up being, and it's been true for some of our greatest companies. One thing that hasn't changed is the, the really needle-moving, earth-changing, world-changing companies tend to have surprisingly humble, frugal beginnings. They meet all those other characteristics I, get, I described, but it's original pictures of the two Steves at Apple when the founder of Sequoia gave them the first million dollars to start Apple in their garage, or Trip starting Electronic Arts, Sandy and Len, Cisco. More recently, Jerry and David, Larry Sergey, Steve Chad Jawed. I mean, these two guys on the left, the two pairs on the left were in trailers at Stanford on the campus. Uh, sucking up all the compute resources. I think that's what raised the flag that, and made us aware of one of them. We've got a call from, from Stanford that said, I don't know what these guys are up to, but they're sucking up all the compute juice over here, so you better check it out. Um, and then Steve, jo uh, Chad, and Jawed for YouTube, uh, the early beginnings of that company, were in our offices drinking our, our Red Bull all the time and uh, draining the fridge of it uh, and before they moved into their little location and got bought uh, you know, when they were still quite small in numbers internally, but massive in terms of their impact. So very, very humble beginnings. And the same is true with the more recent generation of, of companies. Now, what's interesting is from these humble beginnings, at least in the case of Sequoia, uh, we're very proud of the fact that those original investments have turned into more than a trillion dollars of market cap in, in today's values. So I just went through a lot of dramatic technology changes, things that, that I think make the business more exciting than ever, and really uh, you know, just exciting to be a world citizen in terms of the impact on, on your life that some of these things are gonna have. But I also described some of the sort of core tenets that I don't really think have changed much in the way of starting what could be a great company or investing in a great company. Thank you.
catch all of it, but I guess it was a lot of compliments about our uh, stature in the industry and then how do we think forward-looking about potentially changing or, or shaping the industry. We think about it slightly differently, which is uh, for us, the entire business is still completely founder-driven. So it's really, it's not us shaping things, it's us making sure we're always uh, top of mind and in front of um, the bit where the best founders are going to emerge. Um, and what their thought process is and staying in sync so that it, it is important for us to be as on top of the trends as our founders are because uh, there's sort of a connection that has to be made. When you have that first interaction with a founder, I can tell you in much of VC, VC land, it's quite competitive. So it's really all about you know, the connection you make. Yes, the, the brand name and the history and so on can mean something and maybe that's what got you the meeting. Uh, but after that, there's another number of other really good firms too. So after that, it's all about your connection with the entrepreneur. And do you really understand and can you add value to what that entrepreneur is thinking about in the first place? So what that causes us to do inside and focus on, you know, uh, obsessively is actually making sure that we ourselves are obsessively staying on top of trends and getting ahead of trends and so on. So that when we have that conversation of, with the founder led great new idea that we can relate and that founder says, oh my gosh, you guys get it, and, and you know, feels comfortable um, getting, uh, working with us to, to help build the company. The other thing we've done in terms of a guiding principle is the way we think about it is we've had the great fortune in the prior decades of being you know, early uh, contributors, early, in, certainly with dollars, but in, in other help we can provide in helping to create and get off the ground some of the world's most valuable technology companies. When we look forward, we want to achieve that same goal for the next 20 or 40 years. And that causes us, with that constant rethink of how, how do we make sure we accomplish that, it causes us to be open-minded about changes, about whether markets are changing, geographies are changing. That's actually what led to the decision to plant the flag in some of these other geographies. So Sequoia is now in China, India, and Israel. Um, and that's really what that was all about. It was the question of in the next 20, 40 years, are we sure all the most valuable technology companies on the planet are gonna come just from Silicon Valley? And the answer was probably not. We wanted to be where they were. Other questions? Back here. I think the question was at what stage of a venture do you recommend reaching out to a VC, right? Number one. And then how do you recommend do, uh, doing so? Is that what you said? So to the first question, uh, you know, it actually somewhat depends on the category and type of company. And I'll give you examples. I mentioned how sort of somewhat easy it is to get certain applications off the ground these days, mobile applications or a new web company. So for that, I would actually, we would actually recommend try it. Uh, you know, scrape and claw that very tiny bit of capital you need to just get it going and try it and get some evidence. When we invested in some of our best uh, internet companies, consumer-oriented internet companies, uh, LinkedIn, for example, or Dropbox, they had actually gotten off the ground a little bit on very, very little money, and, and there was some evidence that, uh, you know, there, that people were liking the service and there was stickiness and all, you know, so early metrics, not a lot of metrics, but early enough signs that they were onto something. Because one thing we've learned is in consumer-oriented companies, you know, internet or otherwise, it's really hard to predict. From a slideshow and nothing else, you're just guessing whether it will really uh, click or not with consumers because it's all subtleties as to whether it will succeed or fail, you know, that they get right or they don't. So for those categories of companies, I'd say sort of try it first, try to get some evidence. For others, it's harder to do that. You know, a chip company or, or something else, it's, Pretty hard to go try that first. It takes too much money. So there it'll be based more on your credibility and the strength of the idea and that sort of thing. And then you should go early. Um, second part of your question, uh, in terms of how to get to a, a Sequoia, try everything, be persistent. You know, that'll be actually a sign that you have the right stuff is, if you're really tenacious. But 
You can try the direct approach, emails, hopefully we'll get to it. it we do get flooded with emails, but some of the best companies I've been involved in, I'm the chairman of a company called um, Infoblox right now that's um, market cap is over a billion dollars. And that original lead came from a blind email from the final dirty, he was in Chicago. He sent me a blind email. And you know, first I looked at oh, Chicago, you know, we don't tend to focus there early stage, and then I kept reading, and he just had an incredibly compelling description of what he was up to. So I met with him within a week, and we were investors, I think, within two weeks of that company. And as I said, it's, it's now over a billion dollars, and we own, we own a lot of the company. So uh, try everything. Law firm is good. You know, if you can connect with your early law firm, they oftentimes have connections. So you can try that. Uh, let me move over here. Just this gentleman has his hand up first. Oh, that's, uh, the, the statement was, Jim Getz, one of my partners, I guess made a comment in, um, I think he called it the revenge of the enterprise or something in, in, a, in a conference. Um, and what he was referring to is something that's very, very true, and I'm, I'm heavily involved give, being a sort of infrastructure guy myself. Um, what, is, what Jim was referring to is that we did go through a period where infrastructure, and what I call infrastructure is everything below the app, you know, storage, networking, et cetera, um, had gotten kind of dry from a VC perspective for a while there in the 2000s. And the reason was there was too much stability. You know, network, uh, Cisco and Juniper kind of owned networking, EMC, NetApp owned storage. There wasn't these technology changes, many of which I touched on here, hadn't quite hit the massively disruptive point yet. So there was just fairly sparse, interesting companies or ideas to fund. There were some. We were involved. I was involved in a company, NetScreen, that grew during that sort of slope time. We did Palo Alto Networks, which just went public. That was successful, but not an explosion of companies. That's all changed, and then just in the last few years. And to me, it's because, you know, talking about these technology trends, there's three or four or five threads of change that, in my opinion, hit critical points all at about the same time. You know, one I sort of indirectly alluded to, but I think it's one of the most critical, is the processing power on a Intel server blade, just standard server blade, with however many cores it has and the right internal interfaces and so on, is now to the point that really super sharp engineers from Cisco's or Juniper's or wherever can come and replicate all the functionality, in fact, in virtual instance, so they can take advantage of all this virtualization and moving software around. So essentially in software, on standard hardware, they can replicate the functionality of some of these blades that those companies sell for $150,000 or $250,000. And this is on a four or $5,000 blade. That's massively disruptive. So that's one. Virtualization is another. Um, some technologies like SSD, solid state storage, are another. Um, big data, security changes. They call it the dissolving perimeter because there is no, no notion anymore that this is my enterprise. Here are my walls. That's the pipe that goes to the internet, the hardwire. There's my firewall. I'm done. You know, that's gone now because everyone's using wireless and so on. So, all of these four or five or six things have changed kind of all at once. So now there's an explosion of activity. So uh, it's reflected in, in the investments we've made. I'd say in the last years, we've had a heavy shift back towards you know much bigger percentage of infrastructure companies. Yes? I can very well because I was actually, uh, in ha in, I guess, continue to be the, the, um, the quarterback of our energy or green tech related efforts since about 2007. And I guess the claim to fame I can make is we probably, uh, I know that we lost less money than just about anybody else. So, um, and in fact, in fact uh, made, made some. But uh, no, I, I, the tricky bit for that, and the reason I guess I, you could almost call me the reluctant quarterback on, on that inside Sequoia was, it was awful hard to make, I mean, wonderfully altruistic goals on, for a lot of that stuff, but it's really hard to have a lot of the companies map to those sort of immutable laws of, uh, you know, of startup land in terms of their profit, amount of the money they take, and so on. Um, and it made it tough. So we didn't sort of jump off the cliff in, in some of these companies just crossing our fingers and hoping for, you know, regulatory change to save the day or subsidies to change the day. We were always reluctant to do that, so we didn't. Um, so stepping back, I'd say there are big, really, really tough. We, we would invest really in them, the, the very get to profitability. Um, on the other hand, we do some from our, I guess, clean tech doing really, really well, but they fit that model that I described. You know, there's a, there's a company I'm involved in um, called Tula, 
down in the South Bay, and it's basically signal processing engineers applying their smarts to um, gasoline-powered engines and diesel-powered engines and messing around with the engine control unit in terms of just a different way to fire cylinders and so on, and they're getting massive fuel efficiency savings. And they're very far along on very little capital in and now have you know, very big customer deals. So it's possible, but big categories, at least from our perspective, are pretty tough to plunge into. I'm sorry, I forget the order, but go ahead. Favorite mistake? Um, favorite mistake? Probably. I mean, personally, the companies I've been involved in, uh, it's been market mistakes. It's been um, timing market mistakes. You know, I was involved in some of the telecom companies at the crash. Now, again, the, the claim to fame is, you know, we got cut less deeply than, than others. You know, I think that was a little uh, conscious effort to, you know, try to be a little more cautious when you start to see the, the wind turning. But, you know, didn't get. Uh, weren't unscathed, there were some of those. Um, I think in cases like that, it also applies to some of the clean tech stuff that at least I was involved in. The trick, although it sounds tough sometimes, is you have to know and you, and you have to make sure you try to stay in sync with entrepreneurs that will be um, sort of mature enough to get it when things have changed. Because no one wants to waste their time. You know, VCs, you don't want to waste your money and you actually don't want the entrepreneurs, they, they shouldn't want to waste years of their lives chasing a rainbow that, you know, now has, has you know, faded off into the distance. Um, so in a weird way, some of the mistakes I'm most proud, mistake investments where we lost some money that I'm most proud of were ones where um, we were able to convince entrepreneurs when it was time to go home. You know, maybe you still had lots of money in the bank, uh, it, which is really hard for an entrepreneur to say, I want to go home because I still have money in the bank. I still have a year of cash. But yeah, but the core premise of the company changed. And unless we can do like I suggested, some of the entrepreneurs can do, you know, jig and jag and think of a new business. And sometimes they try, but just throw up their own hands and say, well, look, we can't think of a new business. That's all we had. Then the best thing to do actually is to go home. I actually was, can't, I won't name the company, but this is very successful in that case where we didn't have the voting rights to shut it down. We didn't have any legal authority. So it was simply a moral argument to the founders and they bought it and they agreed. Where I said, look, the money you have in the bank, that's sort of not really your money. It's not really even our money. It's our poor limited partners' money, and our limited partners happen to be foundations and endowments, you know, charitable trusts. So that's whose money we're playing with. You know, do we really want to continue to just sort of waste that money for the next year where, when the outcome is sort of written on the wall, or are we better off going home, giving back what we can, and going on to do something else? And they agreed. So in a weird way, that's the answer to your question. Some of the best, you know, lessons are, are ones where you can see the writing on the wall and admit your mistakes quickly and, and do something about it. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the question is, um, he's seeing a uh, gentleman seeing a, a what appears to be a trend of these middleware type companies that aren't applications and not the hardcore hardware and chips and so on um, that are having trouble getting some attention from from funders. And I would say two things. One, um, I'm not completely surprised because historically, prior to the new architecture, prior to the cloud, um, middleware was typically kind of a bad word in in VC land. Uh, well, it, but I mean, if they get lumped into that category, that might be part of the perception problem. And it was because in the yesteryear architecture, when everything was deployed on site and so on, middleware was tough, right? Because you weren't the 
problem solving application that got the attention of the buyer. You were maybe some necessary piece of glue, but it was hard to sound very sexy and, and sell the glue. Um, I think the cloud actually changes that. And yeah, people aren't using the word middleware anymore, but you know, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, some of those things could be characterized as middleware, but they're sexy now because it's out in the cloud and it's very easy to scale, very easy to deploy um, on top of them. So I'd say yes, there's a trend towards those kind of companies and if they can position themselves correctly, hopefully they can get away from the, the difficulty. I didn't, yeah, get more attention. Yeah. I think it's super exciting. I mean, there was a wave. Uh, this is the, the sorry. The question is financial services. What could I? What comments could I make about that sector in terms of its uh, attraction for for folks like us? Um, so in sort of yesteryear, first ten years or so, or five years or so, I was at Sequoia, uh, late '90s, early 2000s. FinTech, you know, was was reasonably attractive. It tended to be software you'd sell to Wall Street. That was the financial services investments that w that we saw and participated in. With the advent of the internet really taking off, um, there were much more exciting financial services oriented investments. I mean, I guess you could lump in PayPal was one of ours, Stripe uh, is another of ours, Square is another of ours. Um, and they're all enabled by you know, the technology changes, some of which I talked about, to make them much more interesting. I also think just on the pure consumer side, I've seen a lot of companies that do much more interesting things with mobile apps with big, what they call big data, you know, all the data that's available to make financial services more um, useful and accessible to the average person walking around. I mean, a comment was made in a, in a new startup I listened to the other day where they said banks historically have thrived on the confusion of their customer. I mean, the way they get their fees and everything else is really just because it's really hard to figure out what the heck is actually going on with your own accounts. So there's a bunch of companies trying to fix that, and um, I see a lot of them as looking pretty exciting. So long-winded answer, but financial services-oriented companies, I think, are also benefiting from these technology changes and are pretty exciting. Yes? Um, I didn't read the article, so I'm not exactly sure what they were referring to. Um, but you know, clearly, the internet has changed. The, the question was, there's some comments in an article about it, the industrial internet, you said? Right, no, I agree. So let me try to paraphrase a little bit, which was, right the article was about how technology changes, internet um, is enabling, you know, the, the connection of things as they sometimes, the internet of things they sometimes talk about where just about everything, even in a production line, could be um, accessible, generating information, and con controllable, monitorable, you know, you can get reports, you can optimize, you know, from anywhere else on the globe, such that you have an unprecedented level of control and visibility in just about every line of business, you know, heavy manufacturing, an airplane engine, or whatever else. And of course, that, that absolutely is true. I think we'll see dramatic shifts. If you boil them all down, though, some of the biggest disruptive shifts in industries, I think it relates to some of these inflection points we hit in terms of compute, you know, storage, networking speeds, and so on, and, and mobility, mobile devices, mobile communications, all combining to subtly enabling, you know, radical changes in traditional businesses. Uh, how many more we get, uh, uh, this gentleman here? Uh, and then you, after that.
we, we just have our own. The, the question was uh, trend in fund sizes, maybe getting bigger, or do any of these uh, folks who are climbing the stack and raising bigger and bigger funds, is that perhaps a, a trend that will dominate? We can just learn from our own lesson, and our own lesson over perhaps some of the longer sample period than anyone has of the 40 years, is there's sort of an optimal fund size and for different businesses, and you stick with that. And it's not a fun, if you're a good firm, it should in no way, it's not a function of demand of investment. I mean, uh, Sequoia's been in the very fortunate position due to, to historical performance that every time we raise a fund, it, you know, it's a massive over allocation problem we run into. But what we don't is in we'll fix it based on what makes you know, some potential happy LPs because they more than they want. But that's what we do because we've determined that size is the right size. Now, in our history, we're not perfect. When the craziness was happening in the late 90s, our fund size started creeping up as well. Now, again, similar to the comments I made about losing less money than some of the others in the mistakes, you know, we weren't, uh, one partner says, you know, we didn't drink quite as much Kool-Aid as the rest in that we had gone from sort of a $300, $400 million early stage fund size. I think our maximum fund size that we were super embarrassed about in, in hindsight was a $600 million fund. Well, that same vintage, all of our top tier competitors went to $1.2, $1.3 billion funds. And then very embarrassingly, 1999, 2000 funds, when those funds were doing terribly, years and years later, they went back to their LPs and said, guess what, we're returning half the capital, we'll go back to a $700 million fund. Well, that was still bigger than our, you know, where we started with. And, and we still managed, by the way, in those worst funds to pull out a roughly 2x return, which oddly enough got us more uh, kudos from our LPs than the giant return funds of prior years, because everybody was doing that. It was really about, you know, they just wanted their money back. So we've settled back down to about $400 million for the early stage business and don't intend to change. That's just the, the size that seems to work. Uh, this gentleman. We do. There was that slide I had in the presentation of all the sort of constant innovation we ourselves have to do. And if you remember some of the words I flashed on that slide, there were scout funds that we have that we started or combining with Y Combinator and giving them some money and so on and getting our nose in all the different, uh, under all the different tents. And that was specifically to catch all those um, gems early that maybe would get their initial funding from some of those sources. Uh, but the question you had about, you know, how does a startup determine which path they should go. It's sort of case by case. It's what kind of company they have, whether they're just trying to prove an app, in which case maybe it makes sense to go to one of those folks. Certainly we're interested as well. We'd love to hear everything uh, from T0, and we have a pretty good track record of even if we say, you know what, you should probably should go to you know, this particular super friendly angel or helpful angel or not, we have a good track record of uh, then staying super close to the Series A if that was Sometimes we do the seed directly. Um, one thing I would caution, though, is entrepreneurs uh, have to be really careful in this world where over a cup of coffee with somebody who just met you, they shake your hands and give you 100K. If they're going to make a decision that cavalierly, you, you do have to wonder how much help, valuable help, they're really going to provide down the road. And there's a lot of sort of horror stories uh, in the valley of the angels that have you know, spewed a lot of money around and actually end up not being that helpful, and there's some regret. or the startup didn't end up getting what they thought. They got the money, which maybe that's all they needed. But in terms of help down the road, um, you know, they were somewhat disappointed. So you have to be super careful, number one. Number two, in terms of what you give away of your company, that's important too. We, we, we get pretty turned off when a startup walks in the door for a Series A, and they've already done you know, three seed rounds and given away 70% of their company for very little money. Because that actually is a bit of an IQ test for the entrepreneur that they just failed. So, um, and it just makes it hard to, you know, then raise real money and, and have the cap table be normal. We're interested in founders, actually, that are super greedy about their own equity. It's somewhat counterintuitive. You'd think we want the founders that are, you know, if you're superficially thinking about it, would walk in and be ripe for a, you know, VC to come and take advantage of them. That's not the case, because those 
entrepreneurs never succeed. So VCs would pat themselves on the back, boy, I just got such a great deal, and then the company, so what did they actually win? We like the founders that are actually a pain in the ass, a uh, pain in the behind to deal with, sorry. Uh, <laughs> when they walk the door, because they're fixed, not that they have unusual expectations of their company, say they're worth a you know, $100 million, but for example, they're really, they only wanna raise a small amount of money, for example, because they, they know they only wanna give away a little bit at that fragile stage. So anyway, the point is, be careful who you pick if you go the angel route, because there are some really good ones, some not so good, and then be careful about what you raise and how much you give away. Yes? So the question was, do we do only do early stage or also later stage? Sequoia as a firm, uh, in our first, probably 20 years was almost solely an early stage um, technology focused venture fund, you know, series of venture funds. Um, I guess we had dabbled a little bit with slightly later stage funds and a little bit in the 80s, a little bit in the 90s. But it was really uh, mid 2000s that we got very, very serious and decided we wanted to be in the business and, and do as well in the, in the growth equity business as we do in the early stage business. So we got very serious and studied all the models from the competitors in that space, the TAs and summits and others, and sort of picked best practices, merged them with some of our best practices. Um, so we plunged into the growth equity business. It's a separate series of funds, look at totally different complexion of companies, hired some different people. You know, some of us have been around a long time or have a foot in each, but um, so do a little bit of each. I probably do personally two thirds early stage and about a third growth equity companies. Um, but your question about dil financial diligence, obviously there's more to dig into if it's a growth stage company. So it's more about looking at the numbers and historical and models and all that stuff. Early stage, you know, there often isn't much of that. So, and valuation also, later stage valuation can be based on comps and, you know, multiples and all these other things. Early stage, it's, it's you know, uh, it's more market driven issue. It's, it's, it's how much do they wanna work with you versus others what works for us, what works for them, it's fairly arbitrary, you know. Just how do you get, how do we get over this awkward stage, get to be partners, and then worry about building a company and having valuation sky high? That's, that's kind of the trick. Um, let me go way in the back. The question was, how do we see non-technical founders add the most value in consumer-based uh, It, you said, you know, a small team uh, focused on the product initially, right? Uh, I, there are some that can add a lot of value. I mean, typically the, the sort of, quote, business uh, person who comes along with the technical founding team uh, sometimes isn't viewed as all that useful, um, especially if they themselves don't have much experience, you know, fresh out of school, but they happen to be roommates or something with the technical founder, so they're glommed on. Um, and that can be a little awkward sometimes. Uh, but, you know, there are types of non-technical experience that are super valuable in consumer-oriented companies. So somebody could be just, you know, a sort of have really good instincts on the usability side or a design, just, you know, aesthetic kind of design, the UI, the, the understanding human behavior. Maybe they came from a branded, you know, uh, retail uh, consumer product company that is, that is well known or famous for just nailing it in terms of getting all the nuances of usability right. Is that technical or not technical? I mean, they may not be able to code, but they know exactly how to get that stuff right. And that's super important for some of these companies. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know who's first hit, go ahead. I think the question was, do we have any business processes as a service? Uh, companies on our portfolio, do we have a perspective? Well, certainly when we started the India Fund in 2005, that was sort of one of the main categories that, that was associated with Indian companies, is the, the, the business processes, you know, outsourced business process companies. Um, so we had some of those in the Indian Fund. More recently, um, I guess it sort of depends what you mean by business process, because there are a lot of services companies that are quite interesting. There's, there's sort of analytics as a service um, that's becoming really interesting. So when you talk about big data, there are companies now, service-oriented companies, that are either um, will help manage your, in, your big data for you, just in terms of all the infrastructure stuff that you might not want to get your head around, Hadoop and all these other words, 
uh, you don't want to hire IT folks that understand all that. So there's, uh, you know, Hadoop as a service related companies, big data as a service. And then on top of that, there's analytics as a service companies. And those, many of those are, are getting a lot of traction. We, and we have some of those in our portfolio. So maybe one more, this gentleman. I think the question was, uh, what do we look for as signs that things aren't going right? And then what do you do? Uh, it's probably a pattern match kind of reaction that happens, and it can be all kinds of subtle little things. Um, you know, there's certain reporting formats that help. Not that we're big on reports, but, but what I like to do in board meetings, uh, for board meetings, is make sure the entrepreneurs show me the tools, the output of tools that they themselves use. I mean, I like to encourage. Uh, entrepreneurs to not create a dog and pony show just for the board and do a lot of extra work. And there's certain tools, that really simple tools that are super useful. There's a waterfall chart that you might be familiar with in financials. I use that for even engineering schedules. And the whole notion is, you know, you set your original schedule across the top with little icons for, you know, when we're gonna hit beta or whatever. Then as you go down the months, if you're familiar with a waterfall format, you show, well, where are we this month? Where are we this month? And very visually on one slide, all of a sudden say, oh, we keep sliding every single month on product delivery or something. Uh, so that'll be a sign. Um, a lot of companies that blow up, it's, it's personnel related issues, founder conflict, CEO conflict, those you just have to sort of let your spider sense start tingling when you see funky interactions or you know, te obvious tension, people interrupting each other. And then the best protocol is you try to go meet directly with, with folks. I don't like and feel really uncomfortable with, for example, CEOs that seem super uncomfortable if you talk to any of the other VPs. That's a warning sign right there. You know, you want CEOs who say, absolutely, you should take my VP engineering out to lunch as often as you can and, you know, tell me if he says anything I don't know, you know. You want folks who are really comfortable in their own skin and in their role, because if they're not, then sometimes you start to wonder, gosh, what do I not know about what's really going on here? So, anyway, hope that's helpful.